they may be. Thank you, Joshua. Turning 1 Corinthians 7, uh, verses 17 to 14, we're going back into that study uh, that we began last year. Uh, we took a little bit of a break from it uh, to address specifically the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. We went through that and that took us into uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas and so we're we're back. I was looking the other day, you, you may not believe this, you may believe it, it was September the 10th was the last time that we looked in 1 Corinthians. So I'm gonna have to do a little background, a little quick catch up background to, to bring us up to where we are now. 1 Corinthians 7 verses 17 to 24 uh, I want you to stand with me if you would, if you found that in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, we have it on the screens for you. But as I say to you nearly every week, if you don't have a Bible, uh, we're very interested in you getting, securing your own copy of Scripture. You need, to, you need to hold the Word of God in your hand, all right? So talk to us about that, and we'll see what we can do to make that happen. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 17 to 24. I'll read these. You follow along with me in your, in your text or on the screen. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freedman of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. What have we read? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And may the Lord teach us how to uh, embrace the providences unfolding before us uh, which constitute our current circumstances so that the world may see. That's a, sort of a cliche thing you hear, God is good all the time, all the time God is good, but the world may see that in us, that we believe that, we practice that, that, that the world may see that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not just something that is, that is meaningful and, and full of blessing in the so-called good times, but the gospel of Jesus Christ is more than sufficient in all times. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, it's been some time ago since we were looking at 1 Corinthians together. We, we gave this, uh, this study, the overarching theme, the perfect gospel for an imperfect church. And we kind of cataloged for you when we, when we began this back uh, in the, in the uh, summer, spring or summer, uh, that Corinth was a very troubled church. Uh, they had uh, schisms in them, or some people call it schisms. They, they had people taking, a, taking position. Well, I, I liked Brother So-and-So better when he was here. Well, I liked Brother So-and-So. I didn't care if I was Brother So-and-So, but I liked Brother So-and-So. And, 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 and Paul was offended by that. He didn't want people putting him above Apollos or Peter, who had labored there. He tried to point out to them that we are simply messengers. We're servants of God. We're sent. And he said, and to you folks that, that are looking down your noses at everybody that's struggling with this, say, well, we just follow Christ. Now, it's not wrong to follow Christ supremely, but Paul was making, mocking them, saying, you're not sincere about this. You're just, you think you're better than everybody else, the way you're saying it. So he's dealing with this, with this schismatic, uh, this attitude. Ephesians, he says that God gives gifts to the church and, and the church that has uh, someone laboring faithfully in the ministry, in the pulpit, teaching and preaching, pastoring, counseling, then they should recognize that as a gift from God. 
not make too much of that. I've heard people talk about their preachers, and it's, uh, it's shocking to me. I mean, it's almost like they idolize them. There was uh, one, years ago, I remember talking with a, with a family and, uh, and come out of something that was a, a church that was just borderline personality cult. And any time you would ask them about, well, well brother, brother so-and-so says, or brother so-and-so says, or brother so-and-so, I said, that's great, that's, that's wonderful. What does the scripture say? So there's a danger, there's a ditch to avoid. Idolizing preachers, past, present. The other ditch, though, is to, to dis, dis, despise, to esteem lightly, to not recognize that, that God gives gifts to the church. In Ephesians, he talks about apostles, prophets, pastor, teachers, evangelists. So Paul chides them about that. You're not doing well about that. And then he moves on and talks about a serious moral problem in the church. That, that in the name of grace, these folks were overlooking a situation. In fact, Paul says it is... This is so awful that not even the pagans would tolerate this. And it, it's in the category we talk, of, of incest. It's, a, it's an incest in terms of a, of, a, of a young man who has what Paul calls his father's wife. The, the language there leads people to wonder, was that his biological mother or was that a stepmother of, of that, that his father had taken to wife? Paul says excommunicate him. Hand him over to Satan now for the destruction of the flesh. The soul might be saved. We talk about why. Why you do, why you do redemptive, corrective church discipline. It's for the glory of God. It's for the name of Christ upon the assembly. It's for the, uh, for the protection of the integrity. Because when there's, when there's known sin in a congregation, and it's not addressed this way, then it emboldens others to sin. The devil says, yeah, you know, they talk a good game, but push comes to shove. It's just, they're paper tigers. For the integrity and the protection of the congregation and for the good of the individual involved, because, because such a person engaging in habitual immorality, no matter how, how kind they seem to be, how uh, sincere they seem to be, how interested they seem to be in religious things, the scripture says that they will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will perish. So we talked about that. And then he, he went on to, to chastise them because they were, they were not counting upon the sufficiency of Scripture in terms of their own personal dealings. They had people taking one another to court. Now, I told you at the time when we looked at this that if you wanted to insult a woman in Paul's day anywhere in Asia Minor, you referred to her as a Corinthian woman. Cor Corinth was a, was a very uh, immoral wicked place. And Paul says, how dare you go to the courts to settle disputes among you? You ought to take the simplest person in your midst and go, the two of you, go to that person and say, help us. So the gospel's defeated when you do that. And then he gets to chapter 7 where he's talking about marriage. And, and what's, the, what's the grounds for marriage and, and divorce and immorality and things like that. And that's where we've been. So still with that in mind, with with, with marriage in mind, but with a, with a general application to one's providences, one's circumstances. This is what we're looking at today. That uh, there's a principle he's going to lay down. So what do I mean when I say that, that, that the gospel is sufficient in your and my circumstances? Well, I mean that the good news that God looked down upon sinners, saw our plight, showed mercy to us by pitying us, sending his one and only son, his darling of heaven, to come and live among us as a human being, living sinlessly in the midst of sinners, being sinned against constantly, and yet he kept the whole law of God by suffering and dying at just the right time, bearing in his body our sin, when he hung on that tree, enduring God's wrath upon sin so that it could be said that he satisfied divine justice by his suffering and dying in our place, then rising three days later to prove infallibly that everything he said he would do, everything he said God thought of him, everything God sent him to do had been accomplished and would continue to have the abiding effects of being accomplished that's the gospel. 
And that good news is applied to wherever we are in our lives. One of the devil's ploys, and we see how he used it even in the life of Peter. When Peter was walking on the water, they saw Jesus on the water one night, and Peter said, I want to come to you, Lord, and Jesus said, step out. And Peter steps out and steps out of the boat. Remember, he's, he's walking on the water. And, I mean, what an, how, did, how did that feel? And he begins to notice the waves lapping around his feet. He takes his eyes off of Jesus. He looks at his circumstances, and he begins to sink. And I have no doubt that in a group like this, some of you are doing that right now. You've had your eyes on the Lord. You've looked full in his wonderful face. The things of earth have grown strangely dim in the past, but you've been att attracted by them again. They've got your attention again. And you've looked at your circumstances. And not, not so much walking by faith now, but sinking by feeling. So Paul is speaking to this here, still talking about marriage. He's going to get back into marriage specifically in the next section of, of this letter. But there's a principle. You see, we have to realize that there, there's nothing, if we're in Christ, if we've truly come to repent of our sins and confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, there is nothing that can defeat us and the, and the only trip up we will have regards our remaining sin, our manifesting remaining sin. And that's it. So here's the principle. I'm going to give it to you two ways. One, the way that my, uh, my Greek professor, Dr. Curtis Vaughn, stated it in, uh, in our Greek studies in seminary. He's going to be with the Lord now. And then one, the way that John MacArthur states it. I like both of these. Dr. Vaughn said, though conversion to Christ effects radical changes in the moral and spiritual life, it does not necessitate a complete alteration of status. We're going to deal with that in a minute. Indeed, it's usually best to abide in the condition in which one receives the call to be a Christian. That's Curtis Vaughn's expression of the principle. And you're going to see this, this comes up three times in this brief passage. John MacArthur says it this way. Christians should willingly accept the situation into which God has placed them and be content to serve him there. Now, I want to give a disclaimer. Obviously, if a person becomes a Christian and that person is a drug dealer prior to being a Christian, you don't then become, you don't join the fellowship of Christian drug dealers. You don't, if you're, if you're a prostitute before you become a Christian and, and you're saved, you don't join the fellowship of Christian prostitutes. They're clearly lifestyles that you, that you need to come out from among them. But he's not speaking about something like that here. He's speaking about the, the social climate that they lived in in Corinth. So I want you to see the passage, uh, look at it three ways. First, the gospel, the sufficiency of the gospel. The gospel enables you to lead the life to which God has called you. Second, the gospel enables you to find contentment in your circumstances. And third, the gospel enables you to remain in God, whatever your circumstances. Let's see how Paul deals with it. First of all, the gospel enables you to lead the life to which God has called you. Look at verses 17 to 19. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him, portioned out there, and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. The apostle is speaking here with a strong apostolic authority. He said, anywhere I plant a church, I lay down this rule. Now, why is that? Well, he says in another place, you know, look at, in, for earlier in 1 Corinthians, look at the, your calling. Not many wise, not many noble. The, the gospel in the first century invaded the poor and slave culture of that world. Now they were to pray for kings and all in authority because God would, that they maybe have peaceable times. God would have all kinds of people to be saved. 
uh, the down and out, the up and in, everybody in between. But it was, a, it was an invasion of the slave culture. And we always have an enemy of our souls who lies. And he says things like, boy, if, if, you, if you just weren't a slave, think about all the good you could do for Christ. If you weren't in this situation with this man or with this woman, think about how much more you could live for Christ. It's, it's a devil's lie that there's, that there's some place we can be that makes it easier or more, more uh, fulfilling to live for Christ. I want to remind you, our first parents, Adam and Eve, were placed in paradise. It was the, it was the earthly equivalent to heaven. Their environment did not keep them from sinning. So we need to, we need to get rid of this notion. I, I've talked to pastors through the years. And they've been in a church. Do you realize that a lot of guys hop from church to church about every, every 18 months to two years? That's, that's, the, that's the norm when a fellow comes out of seminary, about 18 months to two years. And uh, I told my, my friend Errol Hulse, who was in England, Reformation Today editor, he said, oh, uh, the SBC should provide pasta mobiles where they can simply pull up and plug into something on the side of the building and live there until they go somewhere else. Pasta mobiles. I've, I've talked to preachers who get this notion. They, I remember specifically visiting with a young man, and he said, well, I'm just so frustrated here. And I said, why? Well, I just don't think, folks don't take me seriously. They don't, they, don't, they don't seem to embrace the initiatives I lay out. They don't seem to want to follow. And I said, well, I said, well tell me about the, your time here. And he said, well, he said, I told him when I came here that I would probably be here two, two and a half years or so. And I, I said, stop. I said, basically, what they, when you told them that, they just kind of turned the hourglass upside down and started watching time run out until you left. Other guys I've talked to them say, you know, I just, I think if I could be, if I could be somewhere else. No, the, the biblical principle for pastors is be instant in season, out of season. Bloom where you're planted. Stop kidding yourself. And we all do it. We all do it. Well, if my wife was just, and fill in the blank, boy, my, I'd be more of a fruitful Christian. If my husband was just, I'd be more fruitful. If my children would just, you know, children say, well, if my parents would just, as you know. Preacher said, well, if the congregation would simply, and then the congregation said, well, if the, if the pastor would just. It's, we have in our remaining sin bucket the sin of our first parents after they sinned, the blame game thinking that if, if only something else was different, extrinsic to me, that life as a follower of Christ would be more fulfilling, more fruitful, more hopeful. No, Paul's dealing with that. So he says, let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned, has portioned out to him, and to which God has called him. This word call is the same word Romans 8, 28 and following. We know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. Same word. He summoned us to this. If we're not careful, and then this, I'm not talking here about a, about a, a Muslim a resignation that says, well, it is the will of Allah, you know, and you just sort of give up. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about finding a place to live and share the gospel where you presently are. Doesn't mean you don't try to improve your situation, but it does mean that you do not chafe in discontentment under your present circumstance. So he asked this, was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Talk, talking there in Corinth to, to either Jewish people who had moved there or to Corinthians who had become proselyte Jews and would have submitted to the ritual of circumcision to mark them out as God's people. 
says, is that where you are? Don't think that you need to be uncircumcised. I don't know how you do that. He's clearly speaking tongue-in-cheek for effect. That you remove the marks of circumcision, that that will make you more of a follower of Christ. But I think he says that because of what he's going to say next. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. If you know Paul, if you know the studies in Paul, the letters of Paul, and you know that there was this group called the Judaizers. Uh, Paul at one point calls them super apostles. They really think highly of themselves. And they would come in behind where Paul planted churches in Asia Minor. And they would come into those people and say, you know, we too are of Jewish background like Paul. Uh, and we're glad that you have received Christ. But have you been circumcised? Because, you know, in the, in, in the beginning, God had his people set apart with the mark of circumcision. Have you been circumcised? Because if you've not, then you're only, you're only following Christ part way. You need to be all in, fully embrace. So if you remember, Paul had a controversy. Uh, Timothy, uh, from a Jewish background, had been circumcised. Titus had not, and the brothers were insisting that Titus be circumcised in order for him to be uh, useful. And Paul stood his ground and said, no. Well, this is the principle here. Don't seek circumcision. Don't, don't think that they're, you know, but folks, it manifests itself in all kind of ways today. Oh, you've, you've received Christ. That's wonderful. Have you spoken in tongues? See, adding to Christ, somehow Christ is insufficient. Christ is not enough. Oh, you've received Christ. Well, have you been baptized? Uh, because you know you've, uh, baptism's a part of salvation. You're not really saved if you hadn't been baptized. Ah, oh, you received Christ. Well, are you, are you regularly making confession? Are you regularly taking the wafer? Are you, there's all kinds of things that come up. Ask a Mormon, what must I do to be saved? Believe in Jesus the Christ and do good works. Well, we would all agree that Christians are called to good works, but none of us agree that doing good works is part of what it means to be saved. So as people add things to it, so Paul is here fending off this notion. Don't think you, you have to do or be something more to embrace being all you can be in Christ. Then he goes on, for, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. In other words, a heart that obeys. And we know as we piece together Paul's teachings that circumcision for Paul, the, the, the physical act of circumcision on male babies was a shadowing to come of the circumcision of the heart and regeneration upon all who would be uh, grafted into the new covenant and become followers of Christ. So he lays this down. your place in life, make the most of your place in life where you are now. Make the most of the difficulties and don't let the devil cause you to imagine, well, if I only had something else, and you can fill in the blank, it could be a thousand things, it may be very different for everybody here, then that would make Christianity more meaningful, it would make my usefulness more, more profitable. No. Paul says that's not true. The gospel is sufficient for this. It enables you to lead the life to which God has called you. And always be ready to follow. If, he's, if he calls you into another arena, it's always ready to follow. But don't buy the devil's lie. I want you to see Galatians 5, 6, and uh, 6, 15, just where Paul's talking about this in similar ways. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Faith in Christ produces love for God and love for others. Then Galatians 6.15, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. That's a synonym for regeneration. What counts is the new birth. And in the new birth, faith working through love. The commandments of God, to keep, to treasure them, to guard them, to 
to apply them. We've told you before, when, when Paul speaks this way, he is talking about the moral law summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. What, what is it that manifests a transformed life? Well, it's not wrapping your arms around yourself singing, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. And somebody walks in, shut up. Quit bothering me. No, it's faith working through love. Transform life. You, where you love God supremely, that you have no other gods. And when you discover an idol creeping into your life, you nail it to a cross. You kill it. you don't make an idol factory. And when you discover them, you get rid of them. You don't take God's name in vain. I get so tired of hearing people say, oh my G-O-D. Just taking my God's name in vain. You remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, the fourth commandment. You, you recognize God in his sovereign prerogative, knowing what's best for us, has set aside one day in seven for his people to gather, to, to draw away from the world. It's a day. It's not a couple of hours. It's a day. Walt Chantry has a great line. Uh, Joe Ramey passed out books uh, to, our, to our deacons recently, Walt, Walt Chantry's book called The Sabbath of Delight. And he has a line in there where he talks about how, how too many Christians know that Monday is coming, the next week is coming, and they don't take care of the preparations for that the week prior or Friday or Saturday. And so they turn out making, making Sunday what he calls the week's wastebasket. We, we go through, get the things we haven't done and try to do those on Sunday to get ready for it. And God doesn't approve of that. He doesn't smile on that at all. He would say, that's not, that's not my day, that's your day. He didn't say to remember the, remember the Sabbath morning, remember a couple of hours on the, no, he didn't say that. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, to draw aside. And so you, you, your transformed life embraces that as you, as you come to a greater understanding of what that means. You honor father and mother. You, you practice as a child honoring father and mother so that as you grow into adulthood, you recognize how to relate to authorities. With that commandment, it's attached to promise. There's, there's long life. I won't, I won't go to the aside there of what some parents think sometimes when, when their parent, when their children seem to just want to challenge and habitually disobey them and they think, I want to kill this kid. You know, you're promised a long life. Seventh, sixth commandment, don't murder. Respect life. We're, we're pro-life because of the sixth commandment. We're pro-death penalty because of the Sixth Commandment. If that confuses you, talk to me sometime. I'll remind you what I preached on when we went through the Ten Commandments several years ago. Seventh Commandment, we're pro-marriage. We don't think that you ought to sleep around. We don't approve of it. God's the one who ordained. Marriage is his idea. It's not ours. It's not the state's. No no government years ago came up with the idea of two, one, one man, one woman being joined to one flesh relationship for life. That's God. We're pro property. The right to property so we don't steal. We're pro truth. Truth speakers, we don't lie. And we're pro, watch this, pro God, back to the first commandment. So we don't covet. Covetousness, Paul said, is idolatry. Covetousness is a discontentment with the providences God has placed upon us. Repent of our sin where we have cultivated those providences, played a role in those providences, embrace God, trust him, rely upon him, rest in him, because the gospel is enough. Second thing I want you to see is that the gospel enables you to find contentment in your circumstances. Look at verses 20 to 23. He states the principle again. Look in verse 20. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. This word remain here 
uh, is the same word when Jesus says in, in John's gospel, abide in me and I in you, it's the word abide. We should live in it. There's a, there's a, there's a term I popped up in fairly recent. Just live in the moment. He's in the moment. Just be present. Be woke. You heard that? Be woke. Uh, that's, I thought it was be awakened, but then what do I know? I'm just concerned about proper English. Be woke. Abide. Make the most. Don't let the devil rob you of now opportunities by distracting you. We pastor friends chatting years ago. One of the fellows said, uh, talking about another piece, said, that guy has wanderlust. What do you mean? He's always wanting to be somewhere else. It's, it's not. Uh, it's like people joke about, about men with remote controls and TVs. They're not concerned about what's on. They want to know what else is on. Be present. Remain. Abide. He says you should abide in the condition in which he was called. Again, not if, not if, you're, if you're engaged in sinful activity that, that's against God's law. Not if the opportunity opens up for you to move forward. And Paul addresses that here. He says, were you a bondservant when called? Don't be concerned about it. Don't let the devil lie to you and say, man, if you could just be free. If you had the freedom your owner has. Man, what you could do. No, be the very best slave that man has. You may recall Philemon. Philemon had a slave, Onesimus. Onesimus escaped, and in an interesting providence, landed with Paul. Found himself with Paul. Paul shared the gospel with him. Onesimus was saved. Paul writes Philemon and says, I'm sending him back to you. As a brother. Paul practiced what he taught. Were you a bondservant when you called? Do not be concerned about it. Don't let it weigh you down. Don't let it blind you and distract you from abiding and, and, and making the most of the present moment. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself the opportunity. Right there tells you Paul is not teaching a, a, a sort of hopeless resignation to your situation. What he is teaching is a contentment in Christ that allows you and me to embrace our situation and make the most of it for the glory of God, for the name of Christ upon our lives, for the advance of the gospel. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freedman of the Lord. And he says, if you, you may be a slave, but if you've been saved by grace through faith, you, your heart's been set free. You're the Lord's freedman. You have a liberty now in Christ that you never would have had. You could have been the freest man on the face of the earth, but if you're not saved by grace through faith, you're in bondage. You belong to the devil who wants to drag you down to hell and ask you to join him in suffering for eternity. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. I love the way Paul, under the divine inspiration of the Spirit, plays on these words. You a slave? You know Christ? You're Christ's free man. You're not the slave. You're walking around free? You know Christ? You're Christ's bondservant. And what that teaches the, teaches the slave who's a Christian is no one's really free. No, you're either, you're either right now, everyone in this room right now, either a slave of Christ or a slave of the devil. There's no middle ground. You say, well, I feel free as a bird. Do you know Christ? No. Then you're incredibly deceived. Incredibly deceived. You're in bondage to your own desires. You're being played like a puppet by the enemy of your souls who only has one agenda with you, and that's to kill, steal, and destroy, and do that to everyone you know, everything you touch. That's his agenda. That's all he does. Even what may look like blessings outside of Christ are designed to draw you to hell apart from Christ. And so he says, 
No one's really free. If you're in Christ, doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're the, let's bring it up to speed, whether you're the owner of the company or the brand new employee with the least benefits and privileges. If you know Christ, you're free. In fact, if you're the lowest in the company and you, and you know Christ, you're freer than the owner of the company who doesn't know Christ. Then he says, you were bought with a price. Do not become bond servants of men. Precious blood was shed for you. You don't live your life, watch this, to please men. You live your life to please God. Guess what? If a Christian in the workforce lives his life to please God, he'll probably be the best one there. When I was in seminary, there was a mall down the down the road from campus and they hired uh, they loved to hire seminary students they knew if they harvested seminary students they had people who had bachelor's degrees working part time in the stores knew we weren't going to be there very long didn't have to worry about benefits with us but they loved doing that because ideally men and women in training for ministry worked at a very different motive level than anybody else. And that should be true today, wherever we are. And so he's addressed this idea that uh, the gospel, the sufficiency is found that enables you to, to embrace your circumstances with contentment. Let me warn you, don't complain publicly that's your job. If you, if you bear the name of Jesus Christ, you're not, you, you may be honestly assessing the job, but you're bringing, bringing a poor reflection on your Savior. Being a Christian means that you've surrendered to the Lordship of Christ, and it makes us his slave. Third, the gospel enables you to remain in God, whatever your circumstances. Verse 24, so brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain in God. Now, this is different than remaining in the situation. What he's saying is you need to abide, that's the word there, abide in God. You need, if, if you have, a, have the foolish notion that you're not growing in grace because of where you are, then you're being lied to by the devil. Paul's saying you can grow in, in, in the Lord, you can draw near to God, you can have communion with God in the worst circumstances. How would he know that? He did that in a jail cell. They were thrown into prison, Paul and Silas. And they did not sing, woe is me. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. No, they were singing praise to God, which, which attracted the jailer. He called attention. You see, Paul says, don't let the devil lie to you. You can have co close communion with God in the worst circumstances on earth. And I know some of you are battling some, some challenges. Some of our, our brothers and sisters are really having a difficult, difficult, just a wave of difficult providences. And, and I pray for you. I, I don't want the devil to get the upper hand on you and, and cause you to doubt the goodness of God. In fact, just the opposite. I pray that, as Paul said, I have learned. And it's a learned thing. There's no, there's no Christian pixie dust I can sprinkle on you to make. So I've learned whatever circumstances I'm in, Paul said, to be content. Which means not covetous, not imagining that if I only had fill in the blank, then I would, I would be a better Christian. No. Paul is saying here, in whatever condition each was called. And he says, remember... Why you're there. Own, own your sin. If, if we're in a situation because of our sin, own it, repent of it, but also recognize that somehow in the overarching sovereign providence of God, he has us there. So you're called where you are right now. may not be where you want to be ultimately, but where you are right now is where the Lord has called you. Remain in God. Abide in God. Don't miss the opportunity 
as people are watching. Your family's watching, your neighbors are watching, your friends are watching. Don't miss the opportunity to model for them, Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough. All I need is you, Lord. All I need. Remain in God. And that's a powerful witness to a world. It speaks of draw by the side of God. Be, be clearly in your speech and your conduct on the side of God. And the devil accuses you and says, man, God sure dealt you a raw deal. He handed you the short straw, didn't he? He said, no. You know, here's the testimony. I may not have everything I want, but by God's grace, I have everything I need. More than enough. More than enough. And then live like that. And show the people that this gospel you talk about in other words, if we join in on complaint and grumbling sessions with them and then want to share them the good news of Jesus, how's it good news? I mean, you respond to circumstances the same way I do, they would say. No, no. Let us respond as followers of Jesus Christ who know that whatever's happening around us is not the final word about what's going to happen to us and for us. told you before in Revelation there's a term over and over, the inhabitants of the earth, and it's the, it's the compound word in the Greek, kataoikos, down dwellers. Folks, you live all around down dwellers. They're all in your neighborhoods, in your family. Down dwellers. They, they have sunk their roots in terra firma, in earth. This is all there is. It's all they're going for. They're only going around once. They're going to grab for all the gusto they can get. And here we come along. Peter calls us paraoikos. We're, we're side dwellers. Let's don't act like down dwellers. Let's demonstrate to the side dwellers that we know we're passing through. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. I, I just don't feel at home in this world anymore. And we're journeying to a city whose builder and maker is God. And the world needs to see that and see that the, the hope that we have in that no matter how hopeful or hopeless our circumstances appear, and it becomes an attractiveness to the gospel, and they know that this Christ that we proclaim, and we worship, and we serve, and whose name we bear, is more than enough for all I need. And boy, does the world need to see that today. Does the world need to see that today. I pray that we will show it to them starting in our families, our neighbors, the workplace, that we'll show them that the gospel is sufficient for our circumstances because Christ is enough. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we bow before you in Jesus' name. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this this divinely inspired counsel that God gave to the Corinthians in the first century that, that really rings true for us here today in 21st century America. Help us not to follow the path of, of, the, of the grumblers, the, the complainers, the, uh, the people who always have to have a, have a negative word, a discouraging word. Help us to be people who, whatever's happening with us, folks look and say, man, there's something in that person's life that I don't have. And let us proclaim your goodness, your glory, your grace. In the name of Jesus, show that we abide in you. And no matter what may happen, happen to us temporally in this world, we have all that we need and more than we need through Christ who strengthens us. But we ask it in his name. Amen.